How's it going? It's a pretty good turnout for late in the afternoon. Normally, I usually bail on conventions around this time. So this is, this is outstanding. Thanks for being here. Um, if you have any questions as we're going through this today, feel free to like just jump in if it's something that's just kind of a point of clarification. Otherwise, I'll try and save some time for questions at the end. Um, but I assume that we're all here for the same reason. There's no one left to hire, right? If you're running a bar currently, we are totally out of staff members. Bartenders are getting poached by brands so that they can go represent something and get paid to do that, right? We, when you decided to come on this trip, two people quit. They put in their notices. It was horrible timing, right? There's no one left to hire in our bars. And because of this, we are in this desperate situation where we have to train people to become the bartenders that we want to have in our bars, right? It is, it is a huge challenge for all of us, but it's something that it's important if you're going to run a successful bar that you begin acknowledging and building a program to deal with. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What we're not going to talk about is standing behind a bartender and telling them how to make a martini, right? While that's important, I'm assuming that everybody can figure that out, right? What we are going to talk about is a general idea of what a training program should look like in a bar, why we should value it, and what are the things that most training programs are missing. How do we make a difference in our employees' lives and in turn have them give that back to our bars? And I think that that takes a lot of thought and a lot of planning, and it also takes a commitment on your part to give into training and recognize that it has that potential. I think we're scared of that initially, right? It's a, it's a hard thing to commit to. Training costs a lot of money. It takes up a lot of time when we could be doing one of the many things that are going to go wrong that week, right? But it's important, and it takes that consistency and that dedication, and that makes all of the difference in your bars. So we'll get into this today. So on that shortage, just in the United States, just in the market that I work in, right, about 11.5% of people who work in bars work in bars that self-declare themselves to be cocktail bars. This has changed dramatically over the past 15 years, right? When I started working in cocktails, describing yourself as a cocktail bar was kind of an old relic of a term. And today, cocktail bars are a huge part of the industry. And because of that, we've grown in our segment of the industry so quickly that we can't keep up with qualified people. When we opened Anvil, which was the first dedicated craft cocktail bar in Houston, we basically just hired all of the other people that were interested in classic cocktails. And then we all worked together on a bar team, and it was fine. And we stood around and told each other what the martinis were that we liked. Somebody had like dug up this silly cocktail called an aviation, and we were all really excited about it. And life was simple and grand because it was just a bunch of cocktail dorks who worked together every single night. And that's not how things work anymore. Every single one of those people has moved on to open their own bars, run their own programs, or is doing something different today. And the people that replaced them were great, but around year three or four, we started to realize that we had this problem where we didn't have the same dedicated clan of dorks that were going to start the cocktail movement in our city that were capable of doing all of that information and training independently, right? And we had to start engaging individual people and see talent in them and get that out of, out of them in a totally different way. And I think that's happened in most cities, right? Like if you go back to the history of any particular city, you find a similar story. A group of people with, came together, they opened a bar, things were going great, and then all of a sudden they got spread out and we ran into this shortage where we weren't able to keep up, right? People started investing in cocktail bars that didn't necessarily have the same background as those of us who were interested in the beginning, right? And those people then hired the staff members that we had spent time working with or training, and we were left with this tremendous shortage. And that's the problem. And I think it's a real challenge for our industry in general because our industry has to realize how to deal with this problem so that cocktails don't become an experience that's less, value, less valuable. So that the quality of what a cocktail is and what that experience represents to a guest isn't something that declines. And I have this like, thing that I want you to take away from today, among a lot of stuff. But primarily, like, I would like everybody in this for maintain like. If we don't do conventions like this and like the bars that we're building and stuff like that, will go away. Because if we're not able to say, when people go, what do you want to do with your Friday night? Well, I don't know, we can go to a nightclub, right? We can go get a bottle of wine, or we can go have a cocktail. If the association of let's go have a cocktail isn't really positive and relatively consistent among all of our bars, we're going to have a problem in the future. 
which means that we have to recognize that while we might live in like somewhat of a competitive environment where we need to make sure that we're doing all the stuff Sean talked about before me, and we're making sure that our bars make as much money as possible, and we're making sure that our cocktail bar is better than whatever other bar in our city is competing on whatever best list, we also have to make sure that the general experience of a cocktail is something that's relatively consistent among all of us, right? And that means that we have to start investing in training and we have to start defining what those training programs look like, okay? That's a real challenge because all of us, especially at like a more international conference like this, are dealing with people who come, back, come from all of these different cultural perspectives, right? When we're looking at hiring people, their background influences how they view hospitality. So there was this guy named Geert Hofstad who basically started doing this research about employees and how they engage in 60s. What he did was he measured where employees for IBM initially. And he found that these different employees had different perspectives on the workplace because they come from different backgrounds, which I think is obvious, right? But that's particularly the case in hospitality. Hospitality means different things to people from different backgrounds. It also means different things for us who are trying to provide an experience to those people from different backgrounds. And if we're not aware of these differences and we don't think about them, right, and we don't realize that we have to take someone that has a different background as our new employee to get to that idea about what our workplace culture should look like, we're going to fail that person. We're setting them up for this disparity between who we are and what we define our workplace as and who they are and what their background suggests. Starting to talk about diversity in the workplace and in our industry in general. If we want to have women have more access to the bar environment, then we have to think about the journey that they will go through as our employees. It's in different cultures, we have to think about that, that diversity and their different backgrounds and sentiments about what it means to work in our workplaces. And we have to cater our training programs to appeal to them in particular, right, so that we're sensitive to their needs. And that can be really, really difficult to do especially if you're someone that thinking about these things and being aware of the diversity of the people that are working for you is really important, but also thinking about that for guests is important as well. Okay, so all the fluffy stuff's out of the way. This is basically what we want employees to learn when they initially come work for us, right? We want them to make drinks the right way. Please don't fuck up the martini. We want to provide information about the products being sold. This is this and this is that, right? We want them to do some fundamental steps of service. We might even write that out on a piece of paper and say, these are the things that a guest should experience when they come into your bar. We want to teach them how to handle money so that we get paid, right? We want them to clean up the bar at the end of the night so it's not dirty when we come visit it the next day, right? What do we do when the POS crashes? It's Friday night. It's going to not work on a Friday night. It can never crash on a Monday. It only crashes on a Friday. What do you do when this happens? We're probably going to teach them too much shit about Jerry Thomas, which especially this new generation of bartenders will really not care about, right? And we might even give them some standards on how to treat coworkers with respect, right? Is this like a general basic idea of what it's like for you when you're introducing someone to, hey, welcome to our bar, right? We're really glad to have you here as an employee. These are the things that we need you to learn over the next couple weeks. Pretty standard for any workplace, right? But I think one thing that we fail to do, especially those of us who are, who are older and have been working in this segment of the industry for a while, is that we fail to think about like, what the goals are of the person that we've just hired. Like, what are they trying to get out of this process? They probably want to foster some personal career growth, especially in this segment of the industry, because if they just wanted to make money, they would not work in one of our bars. They would go work in a nightclub, right? They want to work in a fun environment with a great team. They want to develop a better understanding of cocktails and spirits, potentially. Right? They might want to find lasting mentorship, which is important in how you manage their expectations. They might want to learn about bar management or ownership. This might be a pathway to something in the future. Right? They might want to get that brand ambassador job. They might need to just pay for college. They might want to work in a country abroad. And they might want to understand successful marketing strategies. If you don't know the reason why someone is coming to work for you when you develop a training program, how on earth are you going to structure an educational platform that responds to their needs, right? Additionally, if you only hire the person that fits in your very, very specific box for the things that you're going to be able to provide for them, right, and your training program isn't flexible to meet their different needs, how are you going to be able to keep up in today's segment of the industry? 
Because again, we have a massive shortage, which requires that your training program be something that can relate to multiple people. So all of these things are important, but I think it's, it's just so obvious that very rarely do we take the time to say, why, why are you choosing to come work for here? We ask that standard question in an interview, but we don't really listen and then decide, well, these are things that I'm capable of doing for you, right? Or possibly even telling them, these are things that I can't do for you. One thing that I tend to tell staff members now when I interview with them is that just so you know, I probably won't be able to work with you as much as, say, Alex, who's our downtown bar director right here, right? Alex is going to be spending most of the time with you, right? So he'll be the person that's mentoring you the most. And it's important that they have that expectation when they come in. So adjusting those expectations is important, but also saying this is how this training program is going to meet your immediate needs is important as well. This is typically how this gets done though, right? We've got the suffer approach, work your way up from a usually abusive bar back or server position until a bartender finally quits, right? This is the most standard approach in our industry rather than just paying a bar back an acceptable wage and making sure that they would stay and get better at that job over time, right? Since it's such an important part of our, our bars, right? We just use it as this in-between and pass-through moment, right? The angry veteran pairing. Here, we're gonna put you alongside this guy who's worked here for a while, who's probably going to hate you for the first three months until you get faster at your job. And in tip pool situations in the United States, we will make you share income with this new person that's not capable of keeping up. It's a great way to foster a new relationship. The laminated recipe sheet with your own well on a slow shift training program, right? Which is kind of how we started Anvil when we realized that we had to hire more people and we were fucked and unable to keep up with how busy we were. We actually took a bar back and said, please start making drinks. And he's like, well, I've never been trained. And I'm like, will you please just, just make drinks on this recipe sheet so it looks like we're trying, right? This happens all the time in bars. The poacher, right? We should really hire Steve from the bar down the street because Steve's awesome. And then when we get Steve in, we just say, Steve, be Steve now. And Steve is really confused, right? He's like, I could have just kept my old job. Right, and the full metal jacket. These are, this is like when people think that they have a training program that they've developed that's really awesome, but they don't, right? It's an introductory flashcard boot camp that makes you wonder why you're excited about be at the, to be at this job in the first place. But it actually ends like two to three weeks into your employment, and then there's no training after that, right? It was like this initial test, right, where somebody was like, here's everything you need to know to work here, congratulations. Now we'd like you to work here for four more years with no actual personal growth after that. When we should actually have goals like this, we should develop you as a bar professional if you're gonna come work in our bars, right? Especially in this segment of the industry, it is not easy to work in a cocktail bar. It's just not, right? The amount of knowledge that you're responsible for, right? The daily grind of making drinks the right way and shaking that much, right? The amount of time that you have to put into like preparation. I mean, everything that goes into working in our segment of the cocktail industry is extremely challenging, right? And I just don't know why people would come work in our bars in particular that we have in Houston unless they were a pathway to get to a bigger goal, right? I just can't, I can't pay you enough to justify the amount of time that you're gonna spend here and the amount of work that you're gonna put into working in our bars because it's so challenging. But what I can do is make sure that when you leave, you're a better person than you were than when you arrived, right? And to do that, we have to evaluate all the needs of the people coming in and we have to make sure at the same time that we're constantly aware of where they're headed in the future. We want to convey the culture and creative identity of our bar. When someone's working for us, we want, to, we want them at any point in time to be able to say, this is what this bar does, right? This is why this bar is special. And we want them to be able to reflect that attitude. And for that to happen, we've got to take time to train people in ways that we can't write down on paper, right? Which means that as a bar owner or a bar manager, you have to be available, right? You have to take times that might be inconvenient and teach people something about what the bar is and what the goals of the bar are at any given point in that time, right? And make sure that they're capable of understanding and digesting that. It can't be something that you write in a book, right? It's great to have a training manual that you give to someone on day one and follow throughout their time while they're working for you. And we'll talk about what some of ours look like, right? But you also have to recognize that training is something that lives in this gray area in rushed moments, right? Where you have to make the time to get somebody to understand what your goals are. We want to cultivate contributing and engaging team members that will challenge your bar's norms, right? We want our bar members to tell us what's wrong with our bar and to tell us that something might not be right, right? We need them to get to this comfortable place where they're thinking about 
critically what it means to bartend, right? If they're not capable of doing this, right, they're not capable of being a good bartender, especially in social circumstances, right? We need to better understand what the challenges are when guests are walking in at any given point in time and listen to them because this dynamic changes all the time, right? We recently had a, a turnover at one of our bars where we had someone that moved into a different position that had always wanted to open their bar, right? Someone that moved away for a boyfriend in a relationship that wasn't there at the beginning, right? And we lost basically our entire bar team kind of simultaneously, right? And as a result, we have this new bar team that has their own social challenges because the way that they work with each other is dramatically different than the team that worked together before, right? We need them to talk about what the challenges are that they face every single day, and we need them to work through that process of trying to understand how to improve it. And we want to enrich our community by recognizing that hospitality be extends beyond our bar's walls. So this is something that, that is important to me as a bar operator. Um, I never thought that I would stay in the bar industry. I intended to get out about 12 years ago. But instead, I, I just got trapped, right? And I bet that's a story for a lot of us, right? But it's really important to me that the people that work for me recognize that the decisions that we make with our bars are decisions that are ethically motivated, right? That they're aware of the other efforts that we put in to building a company that engages our community. We operate a nonprofit bar that's donated over a million dollars to charity since, de de since December 2012, right? And we want all of these components to be part of who we think the identity of a bar professional should be. Right? And we want to train them to understand that there's a different perspective that they can have on being a bartender that's not simply someone that makes drinks. So we go about this in kind of two different ways, as we talked about. We have these basic needs that we need our staff members to understand. Right? They've got to be able to do the traditional jobs of a bartender. Right? And then we have these advanced needs for growth that benefit our culture and help our bars continue to excel at the level that we want them to excel at, right? So at Anvil, which was our first bar and is, is one of our two more ambitious bars, right? We've got a 12-stage process. It includes a bunch of different stuff, but basically it includes cocktail recipes with supplemental wine and beer content, independent spirits training, cocktail development exercise and menu placements, speed tests, basic bar management tools like cocktail costs, inventory, readings on the history of cocktails and hospitalities, and then we do celebration at the end of this 12-stage process. But what's important is that we constantly expect that our staff members are working through this process. And every single week they get tested on the different elements of this process, and they're asked to repeat the tasks that are required to pass through the stage, whether they're successful or not. So it might be in the beginning a written test, right? We have a drink menu with 116 cocktails on the menu, okay? It's a lot of drinks. We need them to get those 116 drinks down as quickly as possible, right? So we'll test them over two weeks. And that's a lot of written tests. Hey, do you know the drinks or do you not, right? Then over time, we start to get into some of the developmental things that we expect cocktail bartenders to want to be able to do. Hey, we need you to put a drink on the menu, right? So we know that they may not have all of the background that it would take to be aware of what it takes to put a drink on the menu, right? So we want to move them through that process. Right? We're starting off with, OK, you know these basic classic cocktails that we have on the menu. right? Make me a riff on a Tom Collins. OK, these are the components that you can change. Great, let's make another cocktail that would fit in this specific category. Like here, make a tiki drink. Cool, we've done something that fits in a specific category. Now make an original drink that we can place on the menu. Right? This, this process is really deliberate and kind of sounds boring now that I say it out loud. Right? But the deliberate process is important, right? It's important to take the time and say, this is the development that we expect you to have over the next year in the bar. Because typically, it takes about nine months for someone to complete our training program, right? They're moving through these different stages. They're failing or not passing every single week, right? And they'll have to repeat next week because they weren't able to pass the speed test, right? Why is speed something in bars that we don't spend time training when we're not busy, right? We need to take time to tell people, you touch that bottle of gin more than once for a three drink order. That gin should have never gone back in the well. Your method for making this round of drinks should have been beef eater in these two tins, right? Beef eater back in the well. Now we've got a vodka drink. Do the base spirits in that order, right? Or however your bar works, right? But instead, we just tell people on Fridays and Saturdays when they crash that they need to learn how to get faster.
right? That's not an effective way to train someone. They need to be able to think about the things that they're doing wrong on Fridays and Saturdays, on Tuesdays, so that they can practice them and they can get better at developing a methodology that allows them to make drinks in a faster period of time, right? But if we don't make time to do that when we're slow and when the bar is not full, right, they're not gonna have enough content to think about so that they can get better. So we do this by actually putting the new trainee behind the bar and asking them to make drinks for their coworkers. And the coworkers harass them while they're, being, while they're making drinks, right? It's really, it's, it's kind of disgusting, right? But in a polite way. And everybody's been through it, which is another really important part of training, is that when you have a consistent training program that puts people through the same process, it encourages people to help build each other up, right? I know that's really hard. It's really hard to get that number of drinks out in this period of time. I had to retake that stage five or six times, right? It was a real challenge for me personally. And then it helps people stay humble, right? We don't have that angry veteran pairing that we had before because it's easy for us who are managers and owners to point out, hey, you really struggled with this for four months, so let's not act like that wasn't part of your training program either, right? And we can use that as a reference point to talk to people about the different developmental struggles that they're having when they're trying to emerge as the bartender that we want them to be. We also put them through a blind 50 test, right? Where we actually make our bartenders take a series of blind tastings throughout training. So they'll have brandy week one week, agave spirits week one week, gin week one week, right? And they'll need to say, this is beef eater, this is Tanqueray, this is Citadel. But at the very end, we actually take all of those tastings together and we put them down on a 50, 50 blind taste mat, right? And they have to name by brand every single spirit on the board. Now, some of those are easy, like Campari is kind of easy, right? And it's a gimme. But Campari also destroys your palate, right? Which is something about working in a bar on a busy shift. We need you to know that the drinks are right at any given point in time. We need you to be able to handle this under a challenging number of circumstances. And we need you to be so intimately familiar with the spirits that you're working with that you understand how useful they can be in certain cocktails. And you can adjust things on the fly when called on by different guests, right? All of this requires that we engage that issue like in a structured manner. So we have this blind 50 test, taste test. It's really, really difficult for people to pass and then other people pass it on the first time, which tells us something about the differences in people's palates, right? Is that super important to the guest experience? It is in terms of, of cocktails and whatnot, right? But it's also just important in terms of like what we expect out of our staff members. We expect that you are so intimately familiar with the products that you're working with that you would be able to do something like this. And then at the end, we throw them a hundred day, right? So we have I think this is Alex's 100 day. This is Alex right here. And this is him as a baby before he was running two of our bars downtown, right? But we do a 100 day where we take our menu, which has 100 classic cocktails on it. We tape it to the bar top and we put a Sharpie marker down, right? And then we sell every single drink on the menu for $1. And that person has to make that for the public. So typically there's like a line out the door that runs a couple of blocks, right? And this person's just getting murdered for about, it takes about three hours for somebody to finish this process, right? And then at the end, we take like shots as a room and then we get that person really drunk, right? Um, but it's just a great ending celebration to, to these 12 horrible stages that we've put them through, right? That pushed them so far. And then as soon as they're done with that, we start all over. We manage our bars, um, our, our higher level bars as a team right, in which when you're done with training, you're immediately thrown into a management process, right? So if you've, if you've completed training, the next week you will start on inventory with someone else that's done inventory before, and you'll work through that process. And then we shuffle that up every three to four months, right? And it's like, okay, good. Everybody's got a firm understanding of inventory. Let's rotate. Now you're on dry goods, right? Now you're doing this over here, and we'll shift people through different responsibilities until they're totally capable of managing every single aspect of the bar that has a type of daily operation associated with it. This is important because it, it helps everybody understand the different elements that are challenging for a bar, right? 
when it's like, hey, let's create the spring menu time, right? Ideally, no one's grabbing a bottle with two ounces of Smith or and putting two ounces of Smith and Cross in a cocktail because they know that that won't fit into our ABV requirements. I'm using that because somebody actually did that this week. Ideally, they'll know that because they won't fit into our ABV requirements, right? And we'll say that cocktail costs too much money because they understand what our inventory constraints are working in a city that has a pretty low ceiling for cocktails in the United States, right? We're under this like really challenging scenario where we can't charge the same price that people in New York want to charge. We have to keep our cocktails relatively affordable and we need our staff to understand how to execute that. They're only going to learn that by understanding the principles of inventory and we need to get everybody on the same page about that so that we can develop a cocktail menu better at the same time, right? So at that point in time, they've probably been working in the bar for about a year and a half and they're starting to learn these different elements of the process. But I think the, the real goal that, that we need to have when we're trying to develop bar professionals is taking time to discuss the grays, right? There's this thing that happens in our staff meetings like every three months or so. Someone will come in with like a really crazy difficult riddle for us to all solve about how we should have dealt with a problem guest, right? And they're like, well, I want you to tell me what I'm supposed to say in this situation, right? And the answer is, I don't know, make a good decision, right? And we'll talk about and role play, I would have handled it this way, and maybe another manager will say something else, right? But that's the industry that we work in. Like, we don't work in an industry where, it's, where we're trading oil, right? Where the barrels get transferred from one place to another, and there's a market that regulates that transfer, right? And everybody's got HR policies that regulate how everything should interact. Like, ideally, we should have more HR policies than what we do, right? But we just work in an industry that's less regulated and is less explicit, and there are so many grays. And hospitality professionals that are good at their jobs understand how to handle those grays, right? Young staff members, and we're gonna have more and more of those working in cocktail bars, don't know what to do all the time when they're encountering these gray situations. And the only way for us to handle that and to get them to the place that we need them to be is to find time to talk about the grays, okay? So we do that with regular staff meetings. Sean talked about this in the seminar before, about open book management. Before I, I learned that term, we had been doing that for a long time, right? I was having a lot of trouble when I was a younger bar owner getting people to understand the choices that I made, right? I just didn't have the experience to say the right thing. I, I hadn't found that voice myself, right? And at the same time, they didn't understand the troubles that we were having as a business in different situations, right? They're like, why can't we do this instead? Why can't we pay more for this, you know, and just the various complaints that staff members have, they get over those complaints when you do open book management, right? We do this every single week with our staffs, every single week. Everybody comes to a staff meeting, we sit down as a group, and we print out a sheet that said, this is how much we did in sales this week. These were our projected sales, this is what we actually did, it was either plus or minus from the year before. If we had any pricing adjustments, right? we'll start to include that. So yes, we did more in sales, but that was because our prices were this percentage higher in 2018 than we, they were in 2017. Everybody should ideally know what our goal liquor cost percentage is. We wanna run liquor cost at 17%. Did we hit that number or not, right? Do we run a bar that requires that we measure liquor cost every single week because we're having problems with that issue, right? Or can we run a bar that's so consistent that we're able to do that every two weeks and then we can allocate some of that management time to something else, right? We do that to look together collectively. We look at labor. This is how much everybody in the bar got paid, right? Our labor costs for sales this week were this amount, right? This is how much health insurance costs, right? We brought this much in as, as a team in tips, right? We hit 22% in tips which I know is, is different in different countries, but in the United States, that's primarily how most of our team members are making their income, right? If we do less than 22% at our more advanced bars, then we didn't provide the type of experiences that we hoped, right? And tips aren't measures of everything, but they're certainly a measure of something, right? Let's talk about it. Was there something that influenced tips, right? We had a huge wave of people come in on this day because there was this event that we didn't adequately plan for. Right? Or our Sunday was better on a three-day weekend than what we thought it would. Let's make sure that we note that next year and make a change in that regard. Right? We need our staff members to think critically about all these things because that's what it will require of them in the future to be good bar owners as well. Pre and post shift discussions. Specifically, if you're having problems with a team member or you want to see them improve in some manner, right? 
talking to them specifically about that issue before they start their shift is extremely important, right? And people like to say, let's have pre-shifts. Let's talk about what the goals are for today. You know, if we're working in a restaurant setting, let's talk about today's specials, right? And all those things are super important. But if you don't take the time to say to someone, you know, we had this discussion last Friday, and I'm going to be here tonight, right? I'm really going to watch these specific issues, and I want to see improvement in these areas, and then give them an opportunity to perform, evaluate that performance, and then talk to them after the shift, right? It just becomes this vague element of feedback where they're not able to address the specific things that you want to see them improve in, right? And that's really hard because that takes a lot of time, right? You've got to be there for the pre-shift conversation, right? You've got to evaluate them during the shift, and you've got to be there after the shift as well. Maybe that gets split between two managers, right, where you have a pre-shift. Another manager knows that something needs to be evaluated about that person's performance, and then there needs to be an ending discussion about it. Right? But the point is, if there's no plan and there's no follow-up about how this is going to work, right, that employee doesn't get specific feedback back, and they don't know how to improve. They just get frustrated. Right? If you're like, hey, we really need to see you just try and build more relationships across the bar. Right? And they're like, OK, cool. I need to be more social. Right? And they just think that they were more social just broadly, and you don't have any specific examples to reference. Hey, didn't you catch that that guy was from Miami? Oh yeah, well that was a real opportunity, right? We could have recommended these bars in Miami, right? You could have told him that you had never been to Miami before and asked him for some bars, whatever. Like if you don't have a specific example to cite in situations like that, this person just is living in this vague wilderness where they're like, something about my personality is deficient and I'm not making my employers happy, right? That's a horrible feeling. So it requires that you take the time to say, these are specifically the things that we need you to improve on. We want to make bar decisions as a group, OK? Scheduling, in particular, is a really hot button issue in the United States because of tipping again, right? When we decide to put four people on a Thursday instead of three people on a Thursday, right, we've effectively diluted the tip pool by 25%, right? So income that was getting split three ways is now getting split four ways. This is one of the many problems with the tipping system, but it is what it is, right? When we make that decision for people and we force them to live with it, Right? That's a harder pill to swallow. When we make that decision as a group and we talk about what sales look like when there's four people on versus what they look like when there's three people on, right? and that generates this element of income, and we give people an opportunity to respond to what they think should and shouldn't happen on that shift, right? we get to give them the chance to express grievances that affect their personal life. Right? We find out that maybe somebody's especially concerned about that issue because they're having some financial problems. Maybe there's, there's a health issue in the family or something. Right? And we, we provide that opportunity for an open dialogue where we do one of two things. Right? We learn something about the group in general, right? and we get feedback from the bar that helps them critically analyze the situation that they're in as a team. Right? Or we learn more about them as an individual, and we're able to respond to them individually and say, these are things that we specifically need you to do in this situation. Right? If you don't make that decision as a group, if you just say, these are the things that I've decided we're going to change about the bar this week, you lose all of those opportunities with your staff members, right? I especially think this is true with pricing, right? And I'll talk about pricing again because I think pricing is a huge thing for me. I think that, that cocktail prices are getting way, way, way too expensive, right? I think that we're, we're seeing a situation where we've got more competitive markets for cocktails emerging in almost every single metropolitan area globally, right? And people's response to maintaining their sales is to increase prices, right? I just think it's happening everywhere. And I think it's a real problem, right? If, if we continue to do this, then we're going to make the cocktail experience something that's just not accessible for a wider consumer base, and we're going to have problems as an industry, right? But one thing that I really like to do when we discuss pricing is that we get to decide what our goals are as a bar in an open forum with our staff members, right? If we say that we're able to increase prices and we can net this much in additional sales, and you as an owner say, I would prefer to not do that, Right? Because I don't think that we'll be able to maintain the same number of regulars that we do if we increase our prices to that point. Right? Or you just say, I don't think that our cocktail should cost that much money. I'd like people to be able to come here more frequently. Right? When you make that decision along those lines, then you teach something about who you are as an owner and about the bar, about ethos, and what you value the bar as. Is the bar simply something that should generate money? If it is, make that decision and be transparent with your staff members about it. 
right? They'll become more financially focused with you and you'll achieve more of those goals, right? But if it's to do something that connects with people more frequently, then talk about pricing in an open forum and say, we made these pricing decisions because we wanna make sure that this is the type of experience that people can have here because it more accurately describes what that actual experience will look and feel like in your bar. Does that make sense? Support colleagues in the industry. Another really important part, I think, of, of working in bars, especially in cities that have less diversity in bar programs, is to try and create opportunities where you learn from other bars, right? One of the major reasons why people leave is they, they leave your bar because they want to work somewhere else. And there's just this vague notion of like, I want to go to another place and just learn a different perspective, which is certainly important and, and admirable in a lot of ways, right? But if you're able to create opportunities for them to do that, and you're able to respect other bar programs and say, well, we need to look at this cocktail menu over here. These are the things they do right or wrong on it, right? Or give them an opportunity to work with another colleague in the industry, right? When we, when we do those things, we give them access to, to ideas and philosophies that are different than our own, which also might inspire questions about our bar programs at the same time, right? So that might mean taking time to say, okay, well, it's gonna be a staffing problem for us, but we'll figure it out. We wanna support you in this endeavor. Those moments are really important for staff members, and it's also a way to make sure that you're retaining them. And then we want to engage in charitable endeavors as a group, right? Which is something that we talked about previously. It, it's important that we, we recognize that hospitality is something that extends beyond the immediate experience of taking care of a guest, right? For us, a lot of that happens in terms of the, like, the spirits that we buy in particular, right? Like, I think it's really weird that we as an industry don't critically analyze the spirits that we're using in our bars enough, right? We can, we can buy a product, put it on our back bar, and we never have to engage the, le the hundreds of people that were part of the process of putting that spirit on our back bar, right? That's extremely important to me because that's what I was gonna do instead of working in the bar industry. So I like merging those ideas together, right? And by doing that and talking about that as a staff, right, and then engaging in charitable efforts as, as a company, we're able to talk more about why we've built these bars, right? Because it's not just for money, right? If I wanted to be rich, I would go do something else. It, it's a lifestyle and a commitment to, to this, this specific industry and, and why we're choosing to work, into, work in it. This is an example of our sheet that I mentioned earlier that we have in front of us for every single meeting, right? So it's got actual sales, projected sales, scheduled hourly labor, it's got the tax liability for the hourly labor structured into it. It's got the tax liability for the tip income, right? It's got the split between LBW and food. It's got cost associated with each of them, and then plus minus differences in terms of percentage and dollar amounts over here, right? Our staff members who have been working for us for just two months, even if they don't know like every single thing about the history of a cocktail, every single one of them understands this sheet to a T. Right? When we say, why didn't we hit our sales numbers this week? They would say, it's because of this, this, and this. Right? They'll think about it. Why was liquor cost off? It was off for these reasons. Right? We had a spill. You know, somebody dropped a bottle of this. You know, whatever it is. Right? But they're totally capable of understanding and deciphering this entire sheet within a couple of months. Right? That's really, really important. Right? We're training people as a team that can all be on the same page about what our goals are as a bar. But this is the simple truth about training, is that you can't expect staff members to treat their guests and their job any better than you treat them as employees, right? If you don't take the time to make a difference outside of the very basic elements of bartending, and you don't take the time to structure a program, invest in that program financially, make time yourself, and, and really help transform who this person is from when they arrived with you as a bartender to who they are now, right? Then they won't do anything for you that's additional beyond the basic requirements of their job either, right? And I think that initially we like all hoped that the cocktail movement would become that simple thing that we talked about in the beginning where it was like this bar team of really, really dedicated professionals, everybody self-educated themselves, right? For those of us who have been doing this for a while, it's sometimes, frust sometimes frustrating when our staff members don't, right? We wanna tell them things like, you're supposed to know that, right? You work here, so you should know that, but we never provided them any structure for how they should acquire that knowledge, right? It doesn't mean that you can't say you should be responsible for educating yourself outside of the workplace, 
right? But it does mean that you should specifically tell them how they are supposed to evolve as employees when they work for you, right? And if you don't have that type of structure set up, right, they're gonna do the minimal amount, right? And if they don't, right, if they're the person like you, you know, that, that goes the extra mile, self-educates, pursues those policies on their own, right, then they will just go open their own bar, right? Because why shouldn't they, right? And you'll have more turnover. They'll go work for a brand, right? And we'll lose another good one to some tequila company that makes bad tequila but pays bartenders well, right? We'll keep losing people, but instead, like there's all of this rhetoric about bartending being an actual profession, right? And I don't think that we're doing enough as bar owners to make that a reality. If we want bartending to be a profession and we wanna be proud of the people that come through our bars and, and who they are when they leave, then we have to take the time to structure a program that helps them get there. Cool? All right. Questions? I'll be right there, okay. It's been a great talk so far, right? I saw you all taking a lot of notes and pictures of the screen. That's great. All right, madam, yes. Hi, thank you, hi. So it's a little bit of a broad question, but uh, there's also that stage when you're looking to hire somebody. I'm sorry, I totally oh. can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. go ahead. So it's a bit of a broad question. So when you, it, it happens to a lot of people, when you hire somebody for a cocktail bar and they come with a few years of experience, but in a very general bar, but they come with a lot of bad habits. Yeah. And I find it very hard, at least myself, to try to change all of those habits to the standard of the bar that I work for, because you end up killing their soul a bit. You end up telling them that what they're doing is not good enough, mm -hmm. or that everything that they learn, forget everything, we're gonna do completely different here. Do you have any advice on how to better educate them without making them be demotivated? I think that's a really tough challenge for a lot of people who are training people to become bartenders because we don't want to squash someone's personality and we don't want to say that the experiences that they've had before they came to work for us aren't valuable because certainly they are, right? Experience is valuable, bad experiences are valuable, right? But it's really important that we, we try to make everybody as even as possible, right? And so that's one thing that our training program does is it tends to reset everybody. Some people might breeze through the training program because they worked in a similar environment, right? So they're like, cocktail recipes? Man, I can remember cocktail recipes in no time, right? They might be fast because they worked in nightclubs whereas somebody else worked at like a, a boring Chili's, right? People are gonna come from different backgrounds. But the, I, the diversity of the cocktail program almost always guarantees that someone is going to encounter something that's challenging for them, right? And I think that moment is like really important and humbling everybody and putting everybody on an even playing field, right? And that only happens when you have a training program that touches on so many different issues, right? It's gotta to touch on, here's the drinks, here's methodology for drink creation, here's like the blind tasting part of our training program is really helpful because it's just like, sometimes you're not as naturally gifted as the person you work next to, right? But we still need you to complete this task, right? Uh, other people are more academic minded, other people are, are more outgoing. And if we don't have measures for all of those different things in the training program, then it can create a situation where like the person that's, that's good at the stuff that is written down, but isn't good at these other things, because we didn't explicitly focus on that in training, they feel more entitled and they don't feel a need to reset themselves at the same time. So I think that you deal with that by like having a lot of diversity in your training program, because it will create some type of, of moment of failure which is powerful, right? And that's when a reset occurs. It's like, I do have something to learn here and I will humble myself to this specific perspective. And I think that's really important. Our questions? Uh. So there are like plenty of bartenders which are like working on the position as a bartenders. And when they're going someone new, they're hired as barbacks. And a few of them don't accept this idea how you motivate them to accept a lower position and to start a new one, a new career to say like that? You know, I'm, I'm a little different in this regards. I actually don't like really believe in hiring people for barback positions and moving them into bartending positions. I just don't, right? I, I instead prefer to hire someone that has less social skills and therefore wants to work in a back of the house capacity as a barback. And I would like to train that person for that job and pay them well, right? I think it's a better approach to bars, right? Frequently bar back positions generate more income than back of the house positions in restaurants do, and they're about the same personality, right? 
and instead, I, I think it's better for us to focus on how do we create a job for this person that's rewarding, that will, will help them over a longer period of time, right? I also like the idea that when we bring bartenders in that haven't had to go through like a, a fire of a position, like just work this hell job, that they will then at some point in the vague future be financially reinforced by having access to a better job. There's something very ethically wrong about that, I think, right? But when we have a young person on the staff that has less experience, it helps everybody remember what it was like to be that person. And sometimes that person is super valuable too at the same time. We like to call those people puppies, right? Like sometimes we might have the opportunity to hire someone that's more qualified than the person that we actually choose to hire, but we find that hiring a puppy at that moment would be good for the staff, right? Everybody on the staff has to help take care of that person. It resets the needs and expectations for the bar. All of these things are different. So I know that wasn't entirely your question, but I also just, I wouldn't believe in a different answer I gave you. Like I don't think that we should make people live through like a weird trial before we give them access to the job that they actually want. We should hire people for the job that they apply for. We should train them adequately for that position and we should pay them accordingly. Uh, by the way, somebody wants to know if uh, the slide deck will be available. If after. what? I, if the slide deck will be available? Uh, yeah, you can just message me on Instagram and I'll get it to you. Um, hi, so my question is, um, do you believe in certain mechanisms into keeping people in the staff contractually? Because obviously you invest a lot in training mm -hmm. and an employee can just decide to leave and use that built up knowledge, yeah. be it halfway through the training or two thirds uh, of the way of the training yeah. and use it somewhere else. So do you believe into contractually restricting people of leaving during that training because then you t practically don't have return on investment? We're not too explicit on the contracts, but we do set forth very established expectations for someone when we hire them because yes, there is so much cost involved in training, right? So what we typically tell someone is, this is what it's going to be like to work here, right? We bring them in for a four hour stod shift and let them ask questions and evaluate us and we evaluate them at the same time, right? But in the interview process, we tell people, this is how much money you will make working here, right? These are our expectations for you as an employee and we talk about the training program, right? And then we also tell them that we expect them to work for us for a certain period of time. It's usually 12 months to 18 months at a minimum, right? And if they don't stay for that period of time, and we fulfilled all of our obligations as an employer, we won't recommend them in the future, right? So that's how we handle that issue. We're very upfront with people about it, right? And, and we tell them that we think that's fair. That also invites them at any point in time when they're our employee to say that we don't, they don't feel like they're fulfilling our obligations as an employer, right? And if they're right, and they say, you know, we're, we don't want to work here anymore because of these specific reasons, right? Then we might reconsider that issue. But yeah, we ask for a certain commitment ahead of time and we expect that out of people that we'll recommend in the future. Hi. Hi. Yeah. I have a two part question. The first, but first, before I ask the question, I want to say I agree absolutely with the transparency that you are talking of. I find in a team you have to be transparent and you have to be able to talk about everything openly. So I thank you for that aspect. Yeah. But coming to that point as well, you're speaking of the pre and post shift discussions. Our post or post shift, do you mean, does it have to be the same night because we finish our shifts at 4 a.m. or uh, do you have to gather the people the next morning, the next day and uh, have the discussion about the previous night or how exactly do you proceed with it? I think it depends on the specific situation, right? Mm -hmm. If we're at a point with an employee where it's make or break, Right, we probably do need to spend that much time with them and it needs to be that explicit. So we can make a decision about whether it's gonna turn around, uh -huh. right, and we can give them that immediate feedback so that the next day we can say, okay, great, this person digested and understood this, this instruction, right? They're able to implement it now. We feel confident continuing to work on that situation in the future, right? It can be broader than that though, right? Yeah. Like a lot of the times I'll grab somebody before I leave and I'll be like, hey, Remember this, this, and this. We're going to talk about this tomorrow. Okay. Right. So I'll take that moment to like plant that seed, mm -hmm. right? And they'll they'll think about it at the end of the shift too. To give them like a chance if I like well, yeah. if I pointed out these things, right? At the end of the shift, when they're breaking down, they'll be like, "I wonder what he wants to talk about," huh. right? And that memory will stay fresher and more vibrant in their head, and then maybe we'll get it the next day, okay. right? Or I'll tell somebody, "Hey, make sure to bring this up in the meeting for me on Tuesday," cool. right? because it wasn't that immediate. But I think what's important there is like, 
being able to create examples from a shift and then talk about them with the urgency and the time sensitivity that you need to. And I guess that's more my point in that situation. I so. I, uh, I have a second part of, uh, to the question as well. You also, uh, uh, you spoke of the bar decision as a group, uh, uh, having a, making a decision as a group and including yeah. all the, the staff basically. Um, now my question is, who do you involve? Because we have people who work twice a week who are quite important as well, but people who work five times a week and have a uh, higher decision power. Now the question is, do you include everyone in the, in the decision you make or the people who actually experience it every day, who live this job, who, who do it as a career basically and not as a side job? I, I don't really think that there are too many decisions you can make as a bar owner that you can't include everybody in on. There are some. Like some things involve like the privacy of an employee, right? And you'll have to make that decision by yourself. Some things require like a lot of immediacy and you'll have to handle that at that, in that certain point in time. But like as far as like how the bar operates, like I don't think that there are many decisions that you shouldn't make as a group, right? In a group setting. Even if someone doesn't have anything to contribute, it's the conversation about the decision that's educational, right? And I think people are also kind of aware, right? Like if we're talking about pricing, Right, and we field feedback from the staff members. What do you think we're too low on? Do you think guests would be receptive to a price at this point? Blah, 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 blah. Everybody understands that explicitly, I have the authority to make the decision if I want to, right? But it's the conversation as a group that's important. And it's also important for me. Like I just find a, a lot of positive feedback in those conversations. But I think more it's like taking the time to have a discussion about what the right choice is, is how people become more educated about why those choices were made. And when people understand the why of why a choice was made in a the bar, they're better able to implement it. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Because I think this gentleman could go on all day. So, does anyone else want to say anything? I have another question, yes? I have a question. So, yes. I'm assuming that people earn well at your establishments. That they what? They earn, they earn good money, they yeah, make good money. Yeah. And it's obviously prestigious to work for you. What about people, uh, say the rest of us, who maybe run bars that maybe aren't that successful all the time? How do we motivate people? How do we make them go through all of these steps when at the end of the day, maybe they're not earning as much as they would hope to? Well, I think that like, I think the biggest mistake that bar owners make when they try to decide, when they try and make decisions for a bar is they try to max out the opportunity at all times, right? Like even Sean talks about this a little bit and, and I kind of disagree with some of his um, approaches, right? Having sat through a lot of his discussions and I think he's super good at what he does, right? But for me, my value is not maxing out our potential as a business. My value is, is finding the right equilibrium, right? That's, that's what's most important to me, right? Like could we pursue a program that's more ambitious? Yes, could we pursue more financial value out of the business? Yes. Right, but we would reach a point where there's, there's a lack of happiness amongst the staff, where our goals don't necessarily match our consumer goals, where our prices don't match the cost of living for, for the city that we work in, right? And so I think that equ equilibrium is always important. So our training programs at all of our bars aren't 12-step training programs. They're 12-step training programs at Anvil, right? And at Better Luck Tomorrow, because those are our two more ambitious bars, right? And then we have different training programs at like our small nightclub, for example, right? Where we've got people that are working part-time, right? We've got a, a more streamlined 12-step training program at the Pastry War, right? Which is a, an ambitious bar from a spirits perspective, right? But doesn't get as busy seven days a week as Anvil, so the, the challenges aren't there as, as much, right? So it's really important that you manage those, those expectations that you put into a training program so that it matches the lifestyle and the reason why someone has chosen to come work for you. Right, so I don't think that like just pushing on the gas is the right choice for a training program at any given point in time. I think we talked about that a lot today because we want to talk about what's possible in a training program, but I, I think you're right. Like making a decision that says that this person has this much time to invest in the training program and it's how we can move them as far as they'd like to be moved, right? And that matches the ambition of this particular bar. That equilibrium is really, really important. Yes, okay. All right. We have a, a just time enough for, uh, I think, you, sir. You're it. Yes, thank Last you. Last question. Hello. This is Flavio speaking from Romania. I have a simple question. All of those steps that you showed uh, on the slide earlier implied really technical, uh, let's say, points. 
What about the social uh, skills of the bartenders? Do you quantify that in any particular way? And do you have any ways of uh, improving upon them? Right. Thank you. I think that's a really hard thing to quantify. Like, I think that has to be qualitative in nature. Um, but I, I think that we can feel when the bar is struggling with those issues, right? Like, I just, I just feel it intuitively as a, as a bar operator, right? And so what we'll do is we'll take time to talk about specifically different experiences that we've had during a week. Like, if things get really desperate, one of my favorite things to do is to ask the group to describe the best guest experience they had that week. Like, give me your best guest interaction. Right? Because it should, like, ideally in our bars, it should be something really special. Right? This, this happened, this person, their car got towed, right? You know, when they were getting off work and then they're here in the bar and we were able to help them get a tow line. I called them a cab so that they could make it to the tow facility that they didn't know where it was at or blah, 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 blah. Right? Like, it should be an experience that's unique. It should be a unique guest interaction that's really atypical. If our staff struggles to share a story, like that about the last week, right? Then that's an indication that maybe we're off in that regards, right? So you can do those things, but I think discussing like that social element can can have some exercises. But no, we don't have the same quantitative data that we do, and I think that that only further reinforces that pre and post shift stuff, right? That when you can cite specific examples, that's the only time that you can really help someone improve in those regards, right? And it needs to be example specific, right? Because they they have to understand. When you say, remember when that happened, here's what went wrong in that social situation, because that's the only way that they're going to shift. And so if you don't have those, ex those specific examples, it's really hard to do that. So yeah, and that's, that's not something you can write down in a training manual. Cool. Thank you guys for coming today. I really, really appreciate it.